Hello, everybody. Welcome to Bible class. We are here studying 1 John chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 13, 14, and 15. That is 1 John 5, 13 through 15. And we're going to read that in just a second. It says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. All right, so this, these verses talk about the intention of the book, the intent of writing the book here. And these two verses speak about prayer. So in verse 13 here, I've written, I've written unto you who believe on the name of the Son of God. So he's speaking, and, and this is written to Christians. It's written to believers. And there's a twofold intent. The first is that you may know that you have eternal life. So there's reassurance there is the first in intent, uh, stated intent. And then the second one, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. All right, so let's talk about the second one first because, well, I like going backwards sometimes. Uh, but this one seems a little bit strange because it, it's stated twice. I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. So who are the recipients? They are believers. They are the ones who believe. And what are they believing? Well, they're believing the name of the Son of God. And one of the stated, is, stated intents of the writing of the book is so that these people who believe on the name of the Son of God may believe on the name of the Son of God. You say, well, isn't that, isn't that kind of unnecessary? If you're writing something so that people will believe, but they already believe, that's that seems like you're you're wasting your time, right? Well, this is reassurance. This is encouragement. People who believe on the name of the Son of God, it's not a it's not over and done with, right? If I make the choice to believe something that I've heard, Jesus is the Son of God. I also need to make a choice to commit myself to that belief. When we talk about faith, we talk about more than just the acknowledgement that something is true or that, that somebody is what they claim to be or, you know, whatever. Here, the belief is that Jesus is the Son of God. What does the Bible say about just faith without works? Well, James chapter 2 says that even the demons believe and tremble. tremble. James 2 we go up here to verse 19. King James says devils, but the word is daimonion or daimonion. So ERV, ESV. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. What do they believe? Well, they believe in God, right? So, I go around saying, oh, look at how great I am. I believe that God is real. And in today's society, that's sort of a big deal. I believe that God is real. Well, more and more people are rejecting that. But even the demons believe that God is real. Of course they do, because they're spiritual beings and they've interacted with God. It's, you know, it's... it's <clears throat> 
like saying that that this room that I'm in is real. Well, I'm here, I can see it. So I believe my own senses. Well, the demons too, they've interacted with God. He's the one that binds them in, in chains of torment. So of course they believe in him because they're in the spiritual realm. So having that kind of faith doesn't mean anything. Faith without works <clears throat> is dead. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Faith alone will not save. So we go back to our passage. Oh, what did I do? In 1 John 5, verse 13, I want you to believe on the name of the Son of God. It's more than just mental acknowledgement. It is the works that that go along with that. It's the commitment. So <clears throat> I want you to commit yourself. I want you to acknowledge in your, in your mind that Jesus is the Son of God, and I want you to commit yourself to him. And, well, okay, but we've already committed ourselves to him. So we need to ask the question then, if I commit myself to Christ, I become a Christian. I, you know, you go up there and sit, you make your good confession. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There's that good confession that everybody hears. It's a wonderful thing. But the thing about commitment is it wavers, right? It waxes and wanes. And in Revelation, the inspired writer John had to deal with this. The, um, Jesus sent a message to the church at Ephesus saying, you've lost your first love. Sent a message to the church at Laodicea, you're, you're neither cold nor hot, you're lukewarm. I wish that you were either cold or hot, but you're lukewarm now. So <clears throat> commitment is, is challenged. So just... To say, yes, <clears throat> these are people who believe on the name of the Son of God, therefore they don't need any, any reassurance. That's a mistake. People do need reassurance. So we have all of these witnesses, right? Three that bear witness and, and you know, uh, the, the, not the water only, but the water uh, Three that bear witness, the spirit, the water, and the blood. So that that's refers to uh, the, Jesus' baptism, or, or that refers to Jesus' baptism, Jesus' death, and the delivery of the, that information. So he's talking about the Gospels there. And John is reinforcing the Gospel accounts. Of course, we have the, the Gospel accounts there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and 1 John is written to reinforce that. That's why he talks about the witnesses given, saying, you follow these things. And, and John, it's, it's supplemental material, right, to the gospel accounts. The book of John was also written so that we might believe. So it's twofold. You may believe on the name of the Son of God. Of course, the first thing we talked about, the second, the first thing is you may know that you have eternal life. And I know a lot of people worry, am I good enough? And they lie awake at night and they wonder about these things. And God wants us to have a certain amount of confidence. Of course, he wants us to strive to do better, but he doesn't want us walking around flagellating ourselves, you know, beating ourselves because we're not doing well enough. He wants us to have confidence. You, you may know that you have eternal life. I am a Christian. This is what God has promised to me. And if I spend my whole day wondering, oh man, am I? Am I not? Am I, you know, am I good enough? Feeling bad about ourselves. There's, that's not, well, first of all, that's not healthy. But that's, but, but see, he says, we have confidence. And, and verses 14 and 15 give us more confidence, right? So we know that we 
have eternal life. And, and we, when it says that you may believe on the name of the Son of God, continue your belief, right? Continue your commitment. You made that commitment, stick with it. You sort of get the same idea to that continue to believe in John 14. I just want to mention it for a second. 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God believe also in me. Well, of course they're believing in him. The idea is continue to believe in me. Keep believing in me. Believe in God. And actually, you believe in God. There, This doesn't have to be a statement of fact. You believe in God. It could be believe in God, a command there. The Greek allows for both, and I, I tend toward the latter interpretation there. English standard, yeah, look, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Not implying that they weren't somehow believing, but that they needed to continue. So John says that again in 1 John 5. I'm writing these things so that you, I'm writing to you people who believe so that you will continue to believe. Now, some reassurance that we get is found in the next verse. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. God hears your prayer. That is a powerful thing to realize, to understand. He's there. He's in our corner. Now, Jesus isn't saying that we're always going to get the answer we desire. He's saying we know that we hear him, or I'm sorry, we know that he hears us. We can have confidence in that. We, you know, if you're trying to get something fixed, for example, and you're trying to go through customer service, and you call them up and they give you the runaround, they don't fix what you need fixed, they don't address your problem, they just say, call somebody else. So you call somebody else and, you know, let's say you go for months this way, trying to get somebody who will answer who will actually fix your problem. Maybe it's an easy problem, but you know, sometimes big companies do this. We don't have to worry about that with God. We know that he hears us. Now, there are some stipulations, right? We have confidence. If we ask anything according to his will, can you ask things of God that are not according to the will of God? Well, absolutely. Once again, we go to the book of James, this time chapter 4. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Do they not uh, Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? You've got a bunch of people who are focused only on what they want and what they desire. Here's a result. You lust and have not. You kill. Wow, oh, they're murderers. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. And then look at this. You ask and receive not. Why? Why wouldn't you receive if you're asking? You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. There is a description of people who are not praying according to the will of God. Why, why do you need this thing that you're requesting? These people were asking amiss, which as the ESV puts it, is asking wrongly. Why? Because they want to spend 
acted on their passions. God does not want to answer a selfish prayer. He wants us to ask the right way. So we go back to 1 John 5. We, we have this confidence that if we ask anything according to his will, this negates then me just saying, well, I'm going to pray for a new Corvette. I should get one. Oh, oh man, wouldn't that be nice? No, you won't get one. We know that, so we know that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, again, we, we have to understand that doesn't mean the prayer is always going to go the way we want. So I pray, Lord, give me, and, and, and I have a hard time with this because this gets into the providence of God and how he influences us, how he affects the realm of men instead of the spiritual realm and i don't have the answers for that i don't know how it works but i do know that he hears my prayer i do know that when things go my way and i receive blessings i know who i need to give thanks to Verse 15, if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. Now, once again, we know that practically speaking, that doesn't mean that you just get everything you pray for because, well, you got a lot of people who have prayed for a lot of things and they don't get them. So sometimes God deals with a situation in a way that we're, you know, we weren't expecting. But the assurance that I have, and I think this is the, the takeaway, this is important, is that God will listen to my prayer. He hears my prayer. And he does answer requests. It's not a given that he's going to, you know, if I request a, a bucket of flour, he's going to zap a bucket of flour in my hand. In the Old Testament, Elijah did something like that, right? Old lady or the, the, the widow that housed Elijah, who gave her never-ending food. Oh, man, that's great in the time of famine. God's not going to do that. He's not going to give us an infinite slice of pizza that just keeps coming back every time we bite it. But he will listen to our prayers. He will hear our, our prayers, and we will get an answer to the request. The answer just might be no. You know, Lord, please help me get this job. And I think of one time we, Rebecca and I did that, prayed we were trying out for a, a place. And looking back, because we went through the adoption agency, um, Georgia Agape, if we would have gotten this job in Tennessee, we wouldn't have worked with Georgia Agape and we would never have our little girl. So there's a situation where I think, man, we really prayed because I wanted that job at the time. It was a, it, you know, it's a, a good congregation. A friend of mine was the youth minister there, or it actually still is. And that would have been great. But I look and see, yeah, I didn't get that. And look at where my life is now. Would I change it? Would I go back and take that job? I really wouldn't. And I thank God that circumstances worked out the way that they did. I don't know that God 
controlled everything. You know, that's a conversation for another day. But I do know that God hears my prayers. He cares about me. And I can be confident of that. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for studying with me. Next time we will pick up with verse 16. And look at this. There's a sin not leading, unto, not leading to death. Man, what is that? Tune in next time. I hope you have a wonderful day and I hope you are blessed.